us and usher in his presence. Let's just pray. God, we look to you this morning. We thank you that there's freedom in the name of Jesus. We thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and in our lives. And we just uh, give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name.
just what you say Though the storms may come and the winds may blow I will make steadfast And let my heart learn when you speak to
those who are here with us Father God who are here with us those who are online in this moment there are a lot of people that need you but for God to be able to do something for you give him your heart give him everything and you will see the transformation that he will bring into you Father God we thank you for this moment we thank you for allowing us, allowing us to be together. Whether you're in a house with us or you're online. We hope the God of Israel, the God of Oasis, will enter your heart and bless you from now on and forevermore. We're not praying you because we're worthy of anything. But in the name of Jesus, your son, amen. Now we're going to have Pastor Peter in the announcement. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Amen, amen, amen. So if he's got your heart, let me hear it. He's what? He's, he's got it. Those of you watching at home, he's got it. Shout it out. He's got our heart. Amen, amen. It's good to see you guys today. As you noticed outside, today was the day. 
not only that the Lord has made, but it's a day to bring your blue bags so that we could uh, replenish what the Rollway Food Bank has lost. So we're going to really overwhelm them with a lot of great stuff. So we welcome you to our service. We certainly welcome those listening online. Just a few quick announcements. Uh, they're in your bulletin as well. A lot of our ministries are going to be starting up in October. So if you're interested in joining a circle, registration is now open. You can go to www.oasisnj.net forward slash or forward slash join a circle. It'll tell you all about it, the times that it starts, uh, if it's for women, if it's for men, if they're, if they're having it online, if they're meeting in person, a lot of good information. So really check it all out. It's, a lot of it is there for you. Also, our uh, women's ministries meeting up. Uh, check out your bulletin. You can take one on the way out. And also, we want to say a big thank you, those online, those here in the building, for partnering with us in giving. Your faithful giving each week is what's keeping us going. It's what's allowing us to reach out to the community. It's what's allowing us to reach out to our to individuals here in our in our church and our, and our partnering churches around the war world in Cuba. Uh, and we, we thank you that you've been able to partner with us, that we're able to help other people. Because as we are able to help people, God's going to help us. You know, we need, you know, it's been a rough year. Last year, it's, it's been rough. But you know what? God is faithful. He owns all the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns all the silver and the gold. And you quote that scripture, if you're having issues in your home, it's in Kings. He owns it all. So amen. So thank you again for partnering with us. God bless you guys. And we're going to hear a great service by Pastor Fred. Also, wait before I finish. Our youth is on its way back later on this afternoon. They're having a great time on the pursuit. Please pray for traveling mercies that they get home safely. And we're going to hear all about the great time that they had. Amen. God bless. All right. Thanks, Pastor Peter. Appreciate it. Man, it's good. Good to see you guys this morning. Amen. Great time to come together, and uh, last, let me see, I think this is the last Sunday, or last weekend of summer, I believe. I'm glad you came to church. Amen. Glad you're watching online. Uh, it is good to be here, and I just believe that God's going to do some great things. Speaking of the word believe, you know, we, we're in church. We hear, we hear the word believe a lot in church. We, we associate a lot with, you know, Christianity and, and reading the Bible. You'll hear, read it and say things a lot of times about the word believe and believing um, the definition of the word believe, when we look at that as believed, it means to accept something as true, genuine, or real ideals. Believe. I'm very familiar with that word. About believing upon Jesus, making him Lord of our life, all these different things. We talk about those things, you know. But what about the practical things we do in our life? You know, I can believe that eating right will make a person healthy and fit, right? How many believe that? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, we believe that, right? We believe to eat right, exercise. I'm just curious, how many believe that that's true? We can be healthier and strong. Okay, good, good. Amen. Hallelujah. How many believe that saving your money, spending wise, staying out of debt can totally change your life? Anybody believe that? Some of you don't believe that, but I, I would just believe that you're just believing with us without lifting your hand. That's okay. We need to have a talk a little bit after service if you don't believe that, because uh, yeah. uh, I can believe that quality time, conversation, honoring, respect, uh, affecting another person can develop a great relationship. Don't you believe that? In marriage or in a friendship, right? Honoring, spending time talking, communication, respecting, all that stuff. Absolutely. But if simply believing was enough to make a difference, think about how incredible your life would be. All the things that we believe, right? Think, think about it. How many times have we, all the things, oh yeah, that's great. Oh, we take, oh yeah, I believe that. I believe that. Yes, hallelujah. And then we turn, you know, next week we turn the page and never look at that page ever again. And maybe we do it every day in our life. We hear something. Oh, yeah, I got to do that. Got to write that recipe down. That's really good. Let's go. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. And we're going to start that next Monday. Everything's going to start next Monday. So I'm going to start next Monday with that exercise routine. We're going we're gonna to start, you know, working on that relationship, that, that marriage. We're going to start. We're, yeah, yeah, we're going to start. We're going to start doing that because I believe that that's important. There's a lot of things we believe are important. But, you know, and also the fact is we live in the information age. We do not lack for any knowledge. In fact, I don't know about you. I can't even... I can't even spell or add anymore, to be honest with you. <laughs> I guess I can spell it. You know, things correct. You start typing, it corrects you, tells you you're wrong. 
I mean, there's so many times I sit down, I'm like, I'll pick up my phone, and I say, spell whatever, or add 2 plus 2 equals what? I mean, I, I know 2 plus 2, but there's so many times I'll just add, instead of just in my head, I, you know, we, we we're so dumbed down by the information, the, the ability to access knowledge, right? Think about that. All the things that we can grab a hold of. You need to know the capital of something. You need to know how to get to somewhere. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a I, I've used it numerous times. There's a, an app on, um, not an app, there's a website, app, whatever, that have the same it's called Rio to Rome or Rome to Rio. It's one of those things with the number two in the middle. It will tell you how to get anywhere from where you are to where you want to go, anywhere in the world. It'll give you the bus schedule. It will give you the flight, the ferry schedule, the boat schedule, the, the mule schedule. It'll give, I don't know about the mule schedule, but it'll give you every schedule that you need. And I try this because I've literally, you know, people that I know in like some remote parts of, of uh, Assam in India, the state there, and I, I've had to get there. And then it gave all, it gives everything. And then it'll tell you hotels in that area. It'll tell you, you know, transports. It, it'll give you train schedules. Everything is right there. It's incredible. So we don't lack for any knowledge because if you need anything, all you got to do is say, hey, I'm not advertising Google, but, you know, you know you'll Google it or, or put it in whatever, and it'll pop up, give you all the information that you need. So, we, you know, we know what we need to know. We believe what we need to believe, but knowing and believing doesn't make a difference all by itself. We believe all those things, but unless we really do something different with it, nothing changes. Jesus did not invite people just to believe the things that he said. He invited them to do what he said. That's a huge difference because there's a lot of people in churches around the world today that believe Jesus, but they're going to come in, hear a message, sing a few songs, go home, and no change, zero change. They believe, oh yeah, I believe that, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, you know, woohoo, yeah, thank you, Jesus. Go home back to the same old lifestyle. Nothing's changed. So listen, yes, believing is huge. We believe upon Jesus and we're saying, yes, I'm not diminishing the word <clears throat> believe, but what I'm saying is this, <clears throat> the things that we say that we believe, oh yeah, I believe this, believe that, believe, yeah, believe, 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 believe. I'm a believer. You know, yes, I believe. But Jesus invites us to not just be a believer, but invites us to be a doer. Because anything that we believe is really not going to change our life and unless we take the next step to doing it, right? We're talking about having a, a faithful life. In other words, not faithful. I'm talking about two words. Faith that's filled and full in our life. Faithful. That, that our life is filled with an enduring faith that, that can stand upon every situation we go through, every challenge. Listen, if I know when I look at with Leslie and I, when we that diagnosed with, with ALS. And anytime some of you have been through horrific diagnoses and things and situations and challenges, whether it's financial, some of you in the last few weeks with the floods and the flash floods we had, people lost everything and basements. How, I had friends, their houses were moved off, the, you know, like three corners of the house were moved off the foundation. I mean, horrible scenarios and situations. But what gets you through to the other side of those things? See, just, you know, just believing that, you know, maybe it'll change down the road, or a faith that is so filled in your life that enables you to withstand the test of time. I like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego back in the Old Testament when they're standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, bow or burn, and they're like, King, we believe that God is able to take care of us, and so we're not going to bow. So if you're going to throw us in, throw us in, and whatever happens, happens. You know, I guess they knew that either we're, gonna, we're either going to be here or we're going to be with him, whichever way. Paul said that at one point. He says, you know, to, to, if, I, if I stay here, it's great because I'm going to continue preaching. Lives are going to be changed. But if I go on home to heaven, that's great too because I'm really going to enjoy that. <laughs> That'd be a whole lot easier than what I'm dealing with right now. <laughs> so, and, you know, so Paul understood that perspective. See, it, it's, this, it's this strength and security that gives you the ability to stand the test of time. See, what we do with what we know and believe makes the difference. And in this series, we're talking about providing these handles or these, these things. And, you know, for today, we're talking, uh, we're, we'll give you one in just a second, but we're going to go over the next four weeks and we tell over five things that we can connect our life to <clears throat> that really helps us build that enduring faith, that faith that fills our life, that faith that enables us to get through the good times, but also the bad times. Because, you know, I, don't even, I had no idea what the percentage is. I never thought about it. But the, I've never thought about looking it up. But I guess I could Google that during service and find out. But 
not now, but, but what we can understand about how many people that say, I, I believe Jesus, I'm following Jesus, hallelujah, thank God. But they believe, but the moment they hit a wall in life, the moment they hit an, a hiccup in life, the moment they hit a tragedy in life, that they just stop believing. And they say, you know, it's just easier living without Jesus. It's just easier to live without all this Christianity stuff. So what do we do with that? How do we move? But how do we continue to move forward so that we can endure those things and come out on the other side of that, you know, not broken and, and shattered, but, but whole, strengthened, refreshed, able to move forward despite what was in, in between, the dash in between where we were to where we are now. It's having that faith to be able to hold fast. How does that happen? If we believe all the right things and don't do anything with what we believe, then we have fragile feeble faith that will crash at every bump in life. I'm going to read that again. If we believe all the right things, but don't do anything with what we believe, then we will have fragile and feeble faith that will crash at every bump in life. And I don't want that. Amen? I mean, I've, I've been there. Many of you have been there. You've had to deal with it. You come out on the other side. Just because you did it one time, I can't sit back and say, well, I'm just going to sit back. I, I, I endured that trial. I endured all that situation. No, I still got to stay full. Amen? I still got to stay filled up and full so I can move forward so he can lead me and direct me through what the next step's through. Amen? So we need enduring faith. The word endurance is, means this. It's the ability to withstand hardship or adversity. It's the ability or strength to continue or to last, especially despite fatigue, stress, or other adverse conditions. It's, it's stamina. See, that's the, that faith to move on, that enduring faith that no matter what we're going through, it's, it's pressing on, it's, it's moving beyond. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're not going to read that, but you, I invite you to go back and, and read it today, but Paul begins to talk about it. He's going through all these challenges and situations and people challenging who he is, all these things. And Paul comes out and he, he makes this, this statement about what he'd been through. And, and it's not Paul sitting there bragging about all the stuff that he went through. It's Paul talking about how that he endured and he's still standing. He's still pressing on. You've heard me say over and over again, I'm always quoting Paul when I talk about the fact I press toward the mark, I, to press on. Because really that's what it is. I mean, we've got to press on. If you're not pressing on, you're, what are you doing? Collapsing? Uh, retreating? I don't know. We, we're called to press on, despite what the situations in life may be. Trusting and knowing. See, it's not me pressing on in my own self. Understand this. See, I can't do it in my own self. I can't press on. There's stuff that I've dealt with, stuff you dealt with. I would not be standing here if I was pressing on in my own strength. But pressing on in the strength of the power of the Holy Spirit that is given to us as the comforter that Jesus said, listen, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be the interceding for you, but I'm sending you someone that's going to comfort you, empower you, strengthen you, so that you can go out and you can endure any situation. That's why I told those that were following him there to stay there in, in the upper room. And when they did, and the power of the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and their life was completely transformed, filled with the Holy Spirit, their life was changed. These guys that just like days before were I don't want to say the word bumbling idiots. That wouldn't be a nice thing to say. But that were con that, that ran away, departed Jesus, that d denied him, and did all this stuff, and were fighting among themselves. Who say, Jesus, when you sit on when when you're you know when you're on your position, can I? Who's going to sit on your right? And who's going to sit on your left? Can we? Can I sit on one side? And he sit on the other? Well, it was a, the jockeying for position and power. And these the guys that are going to take over after Jesus. I would be if I was Jesus, I would have been very worried. <laughs> But he had faith and trust in knowing that what he's implanted inside their life was enough. And once they experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in their life, that transformation, the, the faith in their life rose to a level. They moved past all the stuff of who they were before. And these are the same guys that went out around the known world and literally gave their life. Many of them um, martyred, well, most martyred, hung upside down, uh, crucified upside down, saw in half, all these different things that, that they went through to take the gospel from all around the known world different guys, same bodies, different faith, different experience. They had faith. What, who they were, they believed in Jesus before, but they weren't really, they were following Jesus, but were they really following Jesus? As long as it was easy and good. All of a sudden, that transformation in their life, their life is filled. So Paul talks about the fact he was in prison multiple times, he was whipped over and over, he faced death multiple times. Five times he was beat with 39 lashes, 
And that was the ones that they, if you ever saw the, the, the was it the, the Passion of Christ, the movie, that with the metal and the chunks and stuff, that's what, that's what that is. Where literally they beat you, that the 39 tails that are part of this whip has pieces of metal or glass or chunks in it. And when it goes in, just, you just figure out what happens on a bare back. Five times he got, he got beat with that. He goes on to say three times he was beaten, three times beaten with rods. He was stoned one time with rocks. Three times shipwrecked. Three to, if I was th- shipwrecked two times, one time, I don't know if I'd be getting back on the boat. Three times he's shipwrecked, okay? All right? He spent a day and a night adrift in the, in the sea. Dangers from river, dangers from robbers, danger from men who claimed to be believers and were not. Many sleepless nights, he'd been hungry, thirsty, often going without food, and carrying the burden of the churches that he had planted and was still ministering to. And yet he still is pressing toward the mark. I would say he had enduring faith. And when he makes that statement, and we read that, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, or follow my example as I follow Christ. It's that picture of understanding of enduring faith that you look at all this stuff, thank God, I mean, we could have had a rough week, but I don't think any of us have been shipwrecked three times, floated in the ocean overnight and throughout an entire day, beat with 39 lashes. I, no, no, I, I, I mean, yeah, we go through stuff, real stuff. But what I'm simply saying, if Paul can go through that, he's, he was just a man like you and I, just a human like you and I, and yet he was able to endure stuff that I never want to experience. I can get through my life. You can get through your life and stand on the other side and not have abandoned Christ in the way. Amen? But that we can come forward, not just surviving, but come forth thriving in Christ. Amen? Paul was thriving, even all of this, and yet Paul is still excited about the journey, still excited about moving forward. While he's in prison, before he knows he's about to be executed, before he says his, life, his blood's about to be spent, spilt out, he doesn't know when, but it's about to happen, and he says, and he's writing, he's, he's still planting, he's still investing in Timothy, he's still pouring stuff in the church of Philippi. He is ministering to people because he has a passion to endure. Amen? So you and I, my challenge is this. You know, we we move forward. So Paul said to the early church, as we said, follow my example as I follow Jesus. He didn't say believe as I believe in Jesus. He wasn't saying not to believe in saying that, but he's saying go the extra step because just saying I believe in Jesus, a lot of people say I believe in Jesus. If you, if you hear people talk about, I mean, you know, I've heard people going to battle between, was it, was it Ireland? It was, going, it was like the fights back and forth between Protestants and Catholics, and they all believe in Jesus, but they're all trying to kill each other. This was back a long time ago, but not a long time ago, but it, in my remembrance and watching on TV. All those kind of things. See, a lot of people say, I believe in Jesus, but their life really isn't transformed. A lot of people say, I believe in Jesus, but they're not following Jesus. Because I can believe in Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, I see you way over there. I believe in you, but I'm going to be over here. (laughs) That's not following Jesus. Over 20 times, Jesus says, follow me. Because a lot of people say, believe in Jesus, but but are they really following him? After believing, I put my faith in action to follow. See, I I can't say I believe and not change and and, and not be uh, uncomfortable. You know, I, I, can, I can say I believe. I can say I believe in it's, it's, you know, and, and still not change anything in my life, not turn things around, not really, you know, to have really no, no changes really taking place, not put myself in an uncomfortable position. Not, not, but you know what, when I say, but if I'm going to follow, following is a little more demanding, right? Following is a little bit more unsafe. Following is a little bit more uncomfortable because if I'm following somebody that's going somewhere that I want, don't want to go, I'm like, hey, do we want to just not do that right now? And if Jesus is leading you through situations and challenges in your life or just in life in general or maybe moving you out of your comfort zone, maybe it's to, to witness to somebody, maybe it's to pray for somebody, maybe it's to go out of your way to help bless somebody, whatever. I mean, and that's just, those are just small things because Jesus also leads people around the world to go into places that are unfriendly to Christianity. I was reading an article just last night, and it was, you know, we, we've all listened to it on the news, going back and forth about the, you know, the, the great, you know, the thing, the evacuations in Afghanistan, you know, that long ago, and, and they kept talking about, you know, trying to get all the Americans out, and but there were still Americans that were there, they didn't know if they wanted to stay there or whatever, and, and I was re- reading this article, and they were talking about the Americans that were there that are still there, and when you think about that, you're like, when you think about the situation, you think, well, why in the world would I want to stay there? That they're saying that there's a, a, a chunk of them within there 
that were there not because they couldn't get out or couldn't find a way out or couldn't get to the you know, extraction zone or all these kind of things, but they chose to be there because they've been there for many years as missionaries to the people of Afghanistan. And they made a decision not to leave because they've been there for years pouring into people's lives. And I was reading that article, and I was like, they're really following Jesus into that. Because under a different regime, it wasn't like it was over the last 20 years. This is a situation where that, you know what, they could be uh, killed. They could be martyred for their faith, for witnessing. Yet they've made a decision to stay because they've invested all these years into the people in Afghanistan. And they're still following Jesus no matter what the outcome is on the end. Man, that's pretty incredible. You know, when I've been to some of those places in Cuba and in some parts of India. And there's one particular area. I've shared this before about I was in the northeastern part of one of the, the states up there. And I, I stay in contact with, with both or the ministries that we support, Cuba and out there. And, and I mean, both of them under persecutions, the ones in northern and in northeastern India, you know, literally, and all over India, really, but especially up there. They were, they, I shared about the story about the pastor, about you know, coming home, and they had, they had hung up a group of, of Hindus, uh, radical Hindus that had taken and hung their, his son in the backyard. And he and his wife come back from ministering to, a, a, you know, one of the, the tribes out in the middle of, you know, way out from the, the towns and stuff, come to find their son who had just come home from college, who was going to work with his dad over that period that he was home. And he's dead in the back as a symbol and a sign that we don't want you here, and we don't want you speaking about Jesus here. And I just, what do you do? Do you pack up and leave? And I sat there, and I remember talking to this family, and I was just so incredibly moved because me and the other pastors that were, a couple of two other guys that were with me, and, and we were all sitting there thinking. I knew what we were all thinking, like, wow, you know, we got this American mentality that, you know, hey, we're serving Jesus. We're like, oh, what do you do with that? You, you need to move. We didn't say anything. We did say, like, so what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you do? Well, their daughter, the, the sister of the brother that was, that was mar uh, martyred, mid mar literally martyred, she says, well, me and my husband, we're pregnant right now with the child, but we're actually, as soon as the child is born, we're going to go out into the field. We're going out to some of the villages to continue doing the work that we were doing before, and then before this all happened. The mom and the dad, the, the father who's the pastor, he's still going out, continued on. I was like, wow, how do you pick up? I mean, you, how, do you, how do you pick up from that? With a faith that is filled because you've made a decision to follow Jesus at whatever the cost. And see, see, we look at that and say, well, how can I ever do that? Because what I find is that's where the power of the Holy Spirit within our life, it enables you to do whatever Christ calls you to do, to live out whatever you, whether it's at work, at home, in business, in environment, or family, whatever the case may be, or, or going to other countries, or whatever the case may be. The fact is that he gives you the ability to do that because you are filled with a faith that enables you to take the stand. It's not you going out there saying, if I was there, I'd be like shaking, you know, scared. Well, that's why you're not there because you don't, you don't have that call on your life. They do, and they've accepted that, and they're following that, and as a result of that, they can stand in the face of the fact that, you know what, if I, if I die, I die. If I don't, I don't. I'm going to continue, pick it up tomorrow and continue to go on. And it's hard for, many times for us to understand that here, but when you hear it from the mouth of a person and hear their testimony, hear them sharing about that, man, it, it, it's, it really, it's like, wow, that's really following Jesus. Following Jesus doesn't mean that you're going to be martyred. Following Jesus doesn't mean that you're going to be under persecution. But I believe that we all deal with some type of persecution, not like we see Paul talking about and what other missionaries around the world are doing right now. But there's things that we have to deal with and go through and not allow our faith to be shaken. Not allow our faith to crumble because we're going through a tough time. And, you know, and, well, Pastor, you know, I, I, I'm going through this and I got to pay the bills. Yes, okay. We, we, those are all real things that we all deal with. So we, we move beyond it. Don't allow the things that we allow in our life to, to shake you because in following Jesus also is the guarantee of trusting God that He's going to see you through on the other side. Whatever is on the other side, He's going to see you through in that. See, it's not just following Jesus through all this thing, hoping and praying that God's going to do something. It's walking and following through that, God, you're opening the doors. That, see, Paul did this because he knew. He said, I know. I'm pressing toward the mark. I know where I'm going. 
all the junk he dealt with between point one and point two was the fact is this, that God, you're going to see me through. I know you're going to take care of me. And whatever that is. And Paul, but Paul, knowing the fact that he's going to be martyred most likely, and yet he's okay with that. Wow. Can you be okay with the fact that if you follow Jesus, that you're going to go, maybe sometimes maybe, maybe persecution from family and, and criticism and for your faith and who you're, what you stand for and what you believe or able to step out of our comfort zones on times and situations when it just is challenging, when you know that the Spirit of God is leading. I'm not just talking about rallying, doing stuff that God's not leading you to do. I'm talking about things that God does prompt you to say, hey, you know what? You need to do this. You need to check. Maybe, maybe it's changing things. Maybe it's transforming things in our life. Maybe it's stepping out in uncomfortable situations at times and sharing our faith. Following Jesus is going to, it's that trust factor. We talked about trust as the main, it's the main fuel. It's the main economy in any relationship. It's, it's, it's that with, there's got to be trust in that relationship. And this relationship with God is this trust that I know, God, that as I follow Jesus, he's going to see me through to the end because I can trust my Heavenly Father to do that. See, that's that relationship. That's the ability. Jesus didn't invite people to merely believe in him so that they could go to heaven. He invited people to live a life that reflects their confidence, their trust, their faith in God by following him. He's not just inviting you to, to merely believe, but he's inviting you to live a life that reflects confidence and trust and faith by God. Amen? So the next few weeks, and wow, I went so much on that. I, I, gotta, I didn't even give you what I was going to talk about today. We have to do it because I'll be all messed up for next week. So, but the, the point is, what, so how do we get that faith that's so full in our life? Quickly, we'll jump into this. It's the practical application of doing. Oh, doesn't that sound thrilling? You weren't expecting that one, were you? It's just like brushing your teeth, right? Remember they tell you, up and down, up and down, all these, I have these different things. I mean, you know, do you really think about now, you know, if you're an adult, do you really think about how to brush your teeth? I mean, like, I just soak them. No, we're not talking about those. We're talking about the, <laughs> if they're actually in there and you got to brush them, what do you do? Soaking may be easier. Yeah, I guess it would take a lot of it, but, but whatever, whatever you're dealing with, you know, whatever, that's fine. Either way, it's fine. But, but, you know, it's like, um, you know, it's like, all, that, all the time as kids in school, I remember, I don't know if they still even do that now, but like they had a, they'd have a, a nurse or a dentist come in, and, and they'd have to chew that. There's something they, we had to chew. Remember, like some kind of dye, and they, they showed you how nasty your mouth really looked. You, you said you brushed your teeth, and you, you smile, and everything's like all like, was it like red or blue? I forgot it was red, right? I forgot. These little tablets they had you, did anybody know what I'm talking about? They're looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I, don't, I doubt they still do this because there's, there's got to be something that's like really bad about that, about, you know, anyways, so just, you know, intimidation or what, I don't know what it is. But anyways, you know, but I remember you do that and you, and you look into a mirror and you see like, like all the places you missed. And they would talk about, okay, how you brush your teeth, a certain way you have to do it. Now, when you get older, you don't think about it because you, you've just been doing it all your life. But the practical application of learning how you brush your teeth helps some of you. You got teeth in your mouth because you actually did what you were supposed to do. You did it. You just didn't believe that if you brushed your teeth, they'd be okay. But you actually do. And I'm actually a little neurotic with my teeth. There's a few things I'm a little, like, weird and over the top with. And that's one of those things to the point that the dentist or the, hyge the dental hygienist had told me, you know, they cleans your teeth and all that stuff. She goes, like, she says, Fred, you need to, like, really you're just way too aggressive with this. Like, you're, you're literally wearing off the teeth in the back. Like, I don't know if I'm grinding. I don't know what I'm doing. So they were like, you got to use a soft toothpaste, a brush. you got to be a little more gentler. She says, you, you, you're doing amazing. She, and she was like, you have one of the cleanest mouths I've ever seen. And I was like, hallelujah, I'll accept that. That's good. She goes, but you're going a little overboard, okay? You're a little obsessive. Like, you're grinding parts of your teeth off, you know, in the back. So they're like, just do it easier. Just calm down. Okay? So anyways, so, but I don't know what they have to do with practical. I guess I practically apply it, but I just did it the wrong way, I guess. But anyways, you know, when our active faith intersects with God's faithfulness, our faith grows. So when, when I'm actively walking in faith and it in intersects with God's faithfulness, trusting in him and seeing him, seeing him doing what he says he does, he'll do in our lives. Your faith is going to grow. 
But see, that can't happen if I'm not doing the word. If I'm not stepping, if I'm not walking it out, I can never really see God's faithfulness in my life because I'm not doing anything with it. I'm just, I believe, hallelujah, you believe, but you gotta do something with it. You gotta put it in motion. You gotta walk it out. So your, your faith's like a muscle. It's, it, you know, if you want it to grow, you, you, you gotta exercise it. You gotta put it in motion, right? That's not fun. You know, I, for the last few weeks, I finally, after toes got better, all these different things, so I started now started to get back into a routine, you know, and, you know, get some of the, this laying on the couch for two and a half weeks and then not being able to do anything for three months or whatever, you know, exercise-wise. The pounds that, that are not comfortable for me and for the clothes, that's why you don't see me in suits. I can't fit in anything, you know. I was like, I remember I had, I had, to, I had to go on some weddings and funerals this year, and I'm just like, this is too much information, but anyways... The whole time, I'm like, I'm whole, I couldn't even button the suit because it doesn't fit me. Because it's just, I mean, it's for me. It's like, they, you know, I'm like, I, I refuse to buy a new, I, I refuse to spend money to buy a new suit, so that's not happening. And I can't afford liposuction, not that I'm saying I would do it anyways, but I can't do that, so that's not happening. Um, you know, and they say you can freeze it off, but I can't afford that either, so that's not going to happen. So I just got to do it the old-fashioned way by just doing it. Exercise eating, all that kind of stuff. So I, gotta, I have to do that so I can actually get in the suit and not have to stand there. Everybody just thought I was being all proper holding. I was, no, I was holding the flaps together is what I was doing the whole time. You know, and Nikki and Ashley's wedding. I was sitting there, you know, I'm just like you know, standing there just holding it together because you know, too much information, I told you. But anyways, see, I, so I got to practically apply, practice out good health, amen, to give back so I can actually button the front of the suit. That's the test. The test is when I can button, with it, when the two pieces meet together, amen? I don't know what you're standing with. Hopefully it's a little bit, you know. Not that, listen, there's more tragic things in life than not being able to fit into a suit or something. I'm just using the basics of that. That's not, I want it to change, but you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't change. It probably didn't help me sitting there yesterday as I'm, you know, just wrapping up some stuff. I'm studying, eating, you know, a, a, a half a bag of, of thin pretzels. And that probably didn't help the, the thing. But, but I'm still compensating with exercising and trying to get back in the gym, exercise some muscles and things like that. So I kind of, anyways, we just kind of made it sound like it was okay, you know. But your faith can't grow unless you exercise it. The same way as my, my faith can't grow if I don't exercise it. I can't lose the weight unless I exercise to get rid of it or to build. I can't build muscle in my body, you and your body, unless you're going to exercise it. And exercise, it means I've got to walk it out. Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, Jesus is presenting the Sermon on the Mount. It literally, is a, it literally is a culturally revolutionary message of what he's saying. We don't read it that way now, but the things that Jesus was saying was really so, like, wow, i got to do that? Pray for my enemies? Are you kidding me? Pray. I, should, I should turn the other cheek? I, I should forgive regardless? You know, I should, you know, that, that was, you know, he completely knew concepts that was about putting others first is what he was giving. And it was so practical, but so challenging. It was real world faith building application. And you know what? It literally is the essence of the teaching of Jesus if you go through and read the Sermon on the Mount. That's why it's talked about so much, preached so much about it, because it, the foundation of what he's saying and all those things, it really is, it, it, it was culture changing, but it also brings a, a, a strength in our life of living and walking that out and living those principles in our life. And so Jesus was inviting these people, invites us today, to not to simply believe a different way, but to do life a different way. To not just hate your enemies and pray for your friends, but actually to pray for your enemies. Wow. To actually forgive somebody, to turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. That's just practical stuff, but so challenging to do. But you know what? When I live that out, my faith grows because I'm exercising that muscle of faith. When I forgive, when it's difficult to forgive, I'm exercising my faith. I'm building my faith. When I love instead of hate, I'm, I'm exercising my faith. When, when, I, when I go and turn the other cheek, as all the different things, he, there's so many things he talked about in here. Jesus was inviting them to do life differently. He invites us to do life differently because that's what it looks like to follow Jesus. And he concludes the Sermon on the Mount, and wow, I don't, 
see how we can fit this in. I got I to fix it. This is like really the, the big part. We'll get it in here before we close. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is concluding the Sermon on the Mount, and he begins talking about, um, let's say, we'll just go right in and read it. Verse 24, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine, like all the stuff I just told you, chapter 6, 7, what was it? Chapter 5, 6, and 7, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, whatever, 5, 6, 7, and then concludes in 8. He says, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, Notice he didn't say who believes them, who agrees with them, feels convicted because I tell you this. He says, no, whoever hears these words, all the things I just said to you, he says, I'm just, that's what he's saying to them. And you put them into practice. In other words, you do it over and over and over and over again. You live it out. He says in verse 24, is like a wise man. In other words, they understand that doing, not just knowing, not just believing is what makes the difference. Because a lot of people believe, oh, yeah, that's all great. It's, oh, it's great to, 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 to forgive people. It's great to pray for your, your enemies. Hallelujah. I'm just not doing it because that, you know, my situation's different. No, your situation's not any different. We're still called. If you're, if you're following Jesus, you're called to forgive. You're called to turn the other cheek. But you don't know my situation. I, Jesus didn't put any little addendums to the bottom. He didn't put any, you know, you know, okay, well, in case this situation, no, he doesn't put any of those at the bottom. He just says, forgive. Oh, my, that's so hard. See, that's exercising that muscle. And you know what happens is, the more you exercise that muscle of forgiveness, the more you exercise that muscle of turning of the cheek, and all the other things that Jesus said, the easier it is to do it. Because you're stronger. The same way as if you go to the gym and work out. I mean, when I started back, I remember, you know, a friend of mine, he's a doctor, and he said to me, and I, went, I remember it was like last year. I was getting, you know, this is like COVID situation. Okay, so COVID eating. So he's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to start back. And I, I jumped right into what I was doing before I had stopped for like, you know, months and months. And I pulled muscles in my chest, and I was in agony. And he says, you got to start with 10 pounds, 5 pounds maybe. I'm like, that's like so tiny. That's like embarrassing to go to picking up 5 pounds at the gym. That's for like six-year-olds, right? Who wants to do that? I got to at least look like I can do something. Hello? He says, no, no, you got to start with small and build up. She's saying, how can I do this? You got to start with small. Start with where you are. Build that up. Jesus says, be like a wise man. In other words, in other, in other words understand that doing, not just knowing and believing, makes a difference. He goes and says, who built his house on the rock. That's, he says that, the wise man that builds his house on the, on the rock is a person who has established their life and is establishing their future. Not just now, but this is, you're building to who you are future. For me, I'm building for a future, Fred, not for just where I am right now. Building on the rock, it's labor intensive. It's, it's difficult. It's time consuming. I mean, it's so much easier just to build anywhere. It's so much easier just to drop it down on the dirt and the sand, but to dig a hole, to find rock. And especially for back then, it was just easier to, to plop your house on, on the sand. The problem was when the flash flood comes, it washes everything away. Everything gets, sand gets easily washed away by the current. But rock is able to stand. There's, there's a stability to it. This is what he's saying. You, it's labor intensive. It's challenging. It'll cost you. But ultimately, it's rewarding to build your house on the rock instead of taking the easy way out. You don't see the results right now, but you see the results down the road. Amen? See, that's the whole thing that people talk about. The fact, if you just, I, and I tell my kids, I said, listen, guys, I heard this message when I was in my early 20s. Just even if you put a dollar in the bank away, even if you put $5 in a week, get your, just do it. Do something. Put something in the bank for your retirement. I'm like, I'm like 22 I'm not retiring. That's like ancient times. Wow, I was stupid. Some of you are like, know exactly what I'm talking about. You're like, I ain't going to look it, but I just did the same dumb thing. Didn't do it. You know? Because we, we don't see the value of doing that little step now, but you really see it when you're way down the road. Let's start investing now. Let's start exercising that muscle now. Let's start building ourselves now. Remember, he's talking about how you're doing life, how you're building your life. It's only when we express our trust in God in the real world with our faith 
And as it intersects with God's faithfulness, that we experience the fullness of God. We experience that faith that God wants to do in our life. He goes on in verse 25. He says, he said, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Living out those words of Jesus builds your faith so that you can hold fast. Amen? Verse 26, he says this, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into the practice is like a foolish person, foolish man who built his house on the sand. Because we said sand is easily washed away. The stuff that doesn't have any value is easily washed away. It looks okay right now. And there's many people that go through their life and just, I'm just doing what gets by. This looks good, but the problem is that one flash flood and it's all washed away. One unexpected life situation and it's washed away. It's only the things that you've built on, say, on, on, on solid rock that last, that, that endures. See, when you've gone through situations and, and your life has been turned upside down, I've been there, many of you have been there, you've dealt with death, you've dealt with sicknesses, you've dealt with financial challenges, you've dealt with whatever it is you've dealt with. You find out very quickly what really counts in life. All this stuff, when Leslie and I got that, when she got the diagnosis for a terminal disease, they gave her three, maybe five years to live. And we walked out, you've heard me say this before, when we walked home, we got home, we sat in our, our bedroom and just looked at each other and cried. All of a sudden, everything that we thought was valuable was completely altered and changed. When you're, when you're presented with a terminal disease diagnosis, that you have a time, they've set a time limit on how long you're going to live, you live differently from that point. You look at things differently. Everything that you do, it's not for the quick thrill now of just getting, it's, it's like longevity. Okay, how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to take care of our kids? How are we, you know, how's, how's it going to look like a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, ten years from now? Changes your perspective. But, the, but most of the time, we don't have that warning. We don't have that thing that says, so that's why I've got to live my life today by following Jesus, building and establishing this, because you never know when that storm comes. Because let me tell you, the storm will come. There will be a moment in your life where you will be walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And I want to ask, will your faith, and I'm not trying to be the, oh, wow, that was such a depressing message. This is not really to be a depressing message today. This is going to challenge you to rise up in your faith. Know that God loves you. Jesus has given you everything that you need, his word to enable you to have a faith and a strength that's going to enable you to endure no matter what the challenge may be. It's not always some major life-threatening thing. Sometimes it's just a little stuff that you, maybe it's the neighbor that's driving you absolutely up crazy. Maybe it's the person that lives over top of you that, 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 that's doing, you know, I don't know, salsa classes upstairs or tap classes, you know, tap dancing, whatever. And you're just like, oh, I can't stand that person upstairs. Maybe God's like, hey, you know what? Just move past this. Take it while they're practicing that. You do something else and, and, and stop getting in, in anger about it. I don't, I don't know. I'm just simply, that's the bad illustration. That was not a, a planned one, obviously. But, but the point I'm saying is this. When we come to face the situations we go through, no matter if small or big, we do it knowing and trusting that, God, you're on the other side. You're going to see me through. And I do it with the practical application of doing, living out God's word. It gives me the strength to get through today. And it builds my future to move forward. As Paul said, I'm pressing toward the mark. I'm going to close there. I really didn't finish all the stuff I wanted to say, but I think I gave you enough to be able to run with that today. I want to challenge you. Let's start today. Let's not just believe, oh, Pastor, that was great. I really believe everything you said. Don't believe everything I said. Do me a favor. Start doing what Jesus said. Amen? Live it out. Put it in action in your life. Apply it and watch what he'll do in your life. Father, I just thank you today for your word. I thank you for the opportunity as we apply your word Father, as we follow Jesus, and many times following him is, can be uncomfortable, can be challenging. It may cause us to have to alter things in our own life, to really look at things within us that need to be changed so that we can follow wholeheartedly and deal with those issues. Father, give us the strength to do that. And in doing such, Father, that we walk in this faith, that we, we tap into this incredible faith that you want to fill us with that endures every season of life so that we can continually be faithful in all that we do for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. If you need prayer, we'll be up front. We'd love to pray with you. We'll see you guys next week. God bless. Thank you.